You guys doing good? Just still talking while the pastor's trying to talk. It's no big deal. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. Hey, my name is Caleb Lynch, and I'm the lead pastor here. I get up each Sunday before we start simply to just welcome you and to say I'm glad you're here, and it's amazing to get to see your faces and to just tell you you're welcome here and um, the moment you walk in, your family. And so if I've not gotten a chance to meet you, would you come find me in between services? I'd love to get to meet you. I've got a gift for you if it's your first Sunday. Um, but more than anything, I just want to pray over our morning and kick us off into a great time of worship. Would you guys stand with me? Lord Jesus, we come before you and we call you Lord because, um, because you are seated, because you declared it is finished, and because there is no more work to do, and you, see, you are seated now in a pos position of intercession on our lives. And so we stand here before you and we call you Lord, and we worship your name because you are worthy, and we give you praise and we give you honor because you are worthy. Because you are the one that holds all things together. You are the one that is above all things and in all things and, and through all things. And you are the one that has promised us freedom and hope in your name. And so we stand here as those that have heard your call. And Lord, my prayer today is that this would be a time of worship, a time of remembering who you are and what you've done. But Lord, also, if there's anyone in the room that does not know you, Lord, would today be a day where they would find you? Where their hearts would be drawn to you? Would their hearts be knitted to yours? Would they hear your call? Would they hear your love? Would they hear the hope that is found in your name? And so we give you this morning, Lord, and we trust it into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us worship our amen. King. Who's excited to worship the King this morning? Yeah. We're going to sing a song this morning called Great Things. And uh, I think each of us, if we, if we stopped and thought about it for a little bit, we could think of many, many great things that the Lord has done and does do in our lives, the ways that he provides, the ways that he leads us, the ways that he never leaves us. Um, but I think the, 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 the praise that we give God for the great things that he does and he's doing, they actually find their source um, in the greatest thing that he's done. And we, we can't ever allow ourselves to stop um, coming back to the cross and the finished work of the cross as, as the the greatest uh, thing that, that has ever been done. And so when we sing of the great things that God has done, that is what we declare. Because no great thing that we see Him do in our day-to-day -day lives would ever be possible if it wasn't for that great thing that He did at Calvary. And I wanted to read these words from Colossians 2. Um, and this is what, what it says. In Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him having forgiven us of all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That is the great thing that we worship our Jesus for. And so I invite you to worship him with me.
describe who you are Lord because we know that when we declare what is true of you Lord it is in that state and that posture of worship that we can finally see ourselves rightly and so Lord we give you all the worship you are worthy we give you the glory you are worthy to be praised name above all names king of kings lord of lords Jason Bartley Jr. I am your resident creative. Usually I'm behind you guys, but now again, I am bringing you this week's announcements. First up, Easter is just around the corner and with Easter comes Easter baptisms. It's something we love doing every Easter and this year is no different. So if you have never been baptized and you're thinking about it, you're wanting to know more, 
We do have two classes coming up for that. One is on March 26th, the other is April 2nd. Both of those are Sundays and they will be held during our second hour service. So go into one of those, you don't need to sign up, you can just drop right in during second hour if you wanna learn more about baptism. Those classes really just get to dig into the heart of what baptism is, why we do it, um, and they're very valuable. So if you wanted to get baptized, I strongly recommend checking those out. Next up, we have our Sunday in the Garden Children's Ministry event. This is happening next week. It's a really sweet time where our kids just get to pop on over to the community garden just off campus there, uh, spend time in creation, worshiping, and reading God's Word together. We're very excited for them to be able to do this again this year. And so if you want your child to be able to participate in that, this is only happening for first service. So be sure to contact Lisa, register with her, um, and be sure to get here early because they are shipping out at 9 a.m. sharp. Next up is just a reminder that summer camps are quickly approaching, they're just around the corner. So that is kids camp, junior high, and high school. We don't have all the details figured out for those camps quite yet, but we do have the dates, so be sure to check out our events page, save those dates, and be on the lookout for more info as it becomes available. And lastly, um, we just wanted to let you guys know that there are a lot of things happening that we've planned for everyone, and we're really excited for the church to get involved in. And we just want to remind you guys again that there are a multitude of ways that we have made this information available. So first up is our app. It's one of the easiest ways that you guys can stay involved and in the know. All you gotta do is download it to your phone and you'll be able to see our calendar, our events page. You'll be able to watch old sermons and a bunch of other stuff that's really cool with this app. So be sure to download it. It is a very handy tool. Next, of course, is our events page. Uh, this is on our website odfchurch.org. There you'll be able to see all upcoming events and any pertinent information regarding those events. And lastly, we do offer a newsletter subscription that we send out weekly. Um, you'll see information regarding events and some other cool things that we get to talk about uh, in that newsletter. And those are just a few of the ways that you guys can stay involved and in the know uh, throughout the week. All right, Open Door, that is all I have for you today. I hope that you are all so blessed by the message, by the worship, uh, by the communion of saints this morning. Take care and God bless. What is up, Open Door? How's it going? What do you got for us? Hey, it's good to have this guy back, huh? I missed you guys. What's it's going on? What do we need to know about? Hey, I just wanted to, we just wanted to share something exciting. You've heard it in a few announcement videos, and I thought we need to just kind of explain a little bit more of the heart of this thing. Maybe some of you guys have heard in a, a few of the announcement videos over the past month or so, something about an internship. And so I just want, we just wanted to- We got an internship, come on. We got an internship. I think that's something to be excited about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we dream a lot, the two of us, um, and this is one of our dreams that's actually starting to take flight, and so we're excited about that. Um, and so we just wanted to share what it is, um, and, and that way you guys can kind of share, share the good news, and, and we, can, we can get some people in the program. Yeah. Um, so, it's starting this summer, and uh, what it's going to be is it's going to be 12 weeks, and the hope would be after it starts this summer that there's going to be three different trimesters, if you will, a summer, a spring, an autumn. I think we should start saying autumn. Autumn, I like autumn, yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, Can you say it, though? It sounds better when you say it. Autumn. Autumn. Yeah. It's kind of like a Boston accent sometimes. A little bit, yeah. Autumn. Autumn. Yeah. Getting no, the claw. That's good. Um, and each, each trimester is going to have a different emphasis, but this summer one, being our kickoff one, is so focused on uh, our camps. And so, um, so the big focus for those that do this program will be them getting to be involved with our kids. Um, and each, each trimester will have a different emphasis. And I just wanted to kind of circle back to when we started to dream about this thing, what, what kind of created this thing. And we, we just started to talk about how do we get more hands helping to do the ministry that God's putting in front of us here at Open Door. There's so many things we're excited about. And so one of the ideas that we had that could be part of um, making that happen was, was an intern. But then we thought, uh, I thought of my experience and, and some of my background um, being a part of a Bible school called Cape and Ray, where, where you had students coming for a time, creating community, and it had these different emphases. And I thought, how cool would it be if we could tailor 
an internship program where we could get young adults, um, maybe they're still in college, coming for maybe 10 hours a week, and the emphasis could be they get an experience in serving, but we also get to pour into them. Yeah. And that was probably the thing that we started to get the most excited about, that, that every week we could create a, a curriculum and we could be um, having a discipleship, discipleship session with these young people. And I think one of the things that excited me the most about this idea was that probably these interns are not going to be from this church. The first two that we have lined up already um, have grown up in this church, which is amazing. But I think as the program goes on, these are going to be people that aren't from here. And what got me excited was, on top of it helping us in our ministry, it was this thing of us getting to pour into them, raise these young people up, and know that they're not ours. And that we would get to send them out into wherever God has them going. And so we just wanted to share a little bit about that heart of kind of where this whole thing about an internship program kind of started from and that it, it's coming this summer and um, yeah t tell tell the young people in your life that you know um, and uh, we would love to get them plugged in yeah a couple of details ages 18 through 25 is who we're looking at it is a paid internship so they do get paid um, tons of money they get paid a lot of money <laughs> and then on top of that um, it is 12 weeks each one is 12 weeks but what's really neat is that it, it's one of those things where you could have a side job on top of it it's probably about eight to ten hours a week um, and it's really only on Thursdays and Sundays. So we do a, a whole session on Thursdays and then a little bit on Sundays. So, um, yeah, would you, uh, would you pray with me and us right now for this and what God's going to do through it? Maybe one or two of you, just where we're sitting, just pray it out loud for what God will do in and through this. We trust it into your hands, Lord, and we give you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Um, I went to a father-daughter dance last night, a little daddy-daughter dance. You should have seen me. I was looking good. And um, the same outfit. Yeah, I wore this last night. Yeah. yeah. How, many, how many events can you go to before it's like, you got to change it up? I'm at like two and a half, so... Um, but we were dancing, and we crushed it on the Congo line. The, the DJ said, let's make a Congo line. And so my, me and my daughters were right there at the front, turned back, and there was 25 little girls. I was the only dad in the Congo line, but I was, like, doing it. So that was good. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good time. Um, but I, I just, this doesn't have a lot to do with my sermon, but I just wanted to say it. Um, dads in the room, you're super important to uh, the health of your home, the health of your kids' lives, and your presence is a big deal. And uh, 
I know it's hard. I, if, I, if I'm being totally honest with you, I didn't want to go last night. I, I had this sermon I was prepping and other things, and I was just tired. And, um, but it was delightful. And, uh, but my heart got broken a little bit while I was there. Um, probably a third of the dads were just sitting off on the bleachers on their cell phones. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and I just thought, gosh, like, so much of who we get to choose to be as dads is even just in these little moments, right? And like, I don't do it perfect. None of us do it perfect. But I just want you to know, like, you have a sacred, sacred, sacred um, honor and a privilege. And uh, it's never too late. Like, I know a lot of dads are like, I screwed my kids up bad. <laughs> and, and, but look, it's never too late. Like, you still get to invest even now and pour into them. So, uh, I don't know, that's just a word of encouragement. We're going to learn about Abraham today. He's the father of faith, so it's, I guess you could tie that in somehow. <laughs> but I just felt like sharing that with you. Um, if you've got your Bibles, we will be in Romans 4, 13 through 25. Romans 4, 13 through 25. If you haven't been coming to church a lot in this series, you need to start coming next week on. It is about to get so good. Romans 5 through 8 is like the gold that is found in the Word of God. Um, today will be okay, but next week and the weeks after will be fantastic. Um, we started off this, this section in, in Romans 4 with this concept of salvation through faith, right? That's, that's what's being talked about right now is that it doesn't come through doing this or doing that or, or circumcision or whatever. He goes through all these different things um, but that salvation, that righteousness, that justification, that right standing with God, that eternity comes solely through faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And um, he's using Abraham, if you guys remember, he's using Abraham as like the poster child because the people he's writing to saw Abraham as the poster child of a works-based salvation. And he's saying, no, 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 actually... What made Abraham righteous, what saved him, was his faith, was his trust in God. And that happened far before the law showed up, far before he got circumcised and obeyed God. Way before it, Abraham chose to trust God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so um, he's using Abraham and he's going to continue in that thought. Um, maybe some questions that as I'm going through this, we, we might answer. Um, and you could write these down. We, uh, we understand through what he said that salvation comes through faith, but maybe some questions that people have is, well, what kind of faith do I need? Or how much of it do I need? Or how do I grow it if it's not very strong? And um, I think one of the neat things that our author, Paul, is going to do in this section um, he's got a lot to say through this section, and this is one of those sections that maybe would be easy to just kind of blow through real quickly, but there's some, just some incredible little nuggets within it that remind us of a few of these realities of our faith and what it means to put our trust in the Lord. You guys ready? We'll pick up in 13. So it says this, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heirs of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law, it brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. There is no transgressions. Do you know um, our guy Abe? Do you know that he didn't start off with his name Abraham? Do you guys know that? He was Abram, which means exalted father. And he carried that name with him without ever having a son or a daughter. For 80 years, when people would meet Abraham, they would meet him and they would know that his name means exalted father. And they would say to him, let me see your kids. And he would say, I have none. He said, what's up with your girl? He goes, she can't have babies. <laughs> and... Uh, and then God meets with him, and they have a little hangout sesh, and God says to him, um, I'm going to call you Abraham now. We're going to change your name to Abraham. And what Abraham means is the father of many nations. 
And you can imagine Abraham going, are you kidding me with that one? Right? Like, I've already lived my life in this embarrassment that uh, my name means something that I've never been able to live into. And now you're changing my name to something that is far more impossible. Do you know my girl's old and I'm old? We ain't having babies. And he goes, oh, that's the thing. Um, Forgot to tell you, your wife's going to get pregnant. And so he goes back to his wife and he says, hey, I just hung out with God. And she goes, oh, you did. And he goes, yeah. And he says, you're going to get pregnant. And she starts laughing. She starts laughing. Remember what we're getting into here with Abraham. The author is trying to answer the question, what makes you right with God? Right? He's just unpacked for chapter after chapter after chapter that no one is right with God because of their transgression. And so now he's giving us a picture into, here's what makes you right with God. Your faith. And he, and he takes this interesting moment in history to lay it out for us. This, this promise that comes to a man named Abraham. This promise of a land, this promise of a lineage, this promise of, of a, a, a people, this promise of a way, this promise of a God who is faithful to a people, this promise of a lineage that will be heirs to the entire world. Do you know you're part of that lineage? And he, uh, he starts by saying, remember, uh, this promise, this seal and this promise, that this thing that is moving through Abraham, this thing that is going to be a, available to all, this, this thing that gets ushered in through grace and faith, it's not of law. It's not of special religions or rules. And he's trying to say, come on, remember that those are not the things that make you righteous. That those aren't the things that justify you. Um, he, he says something kind of interesting in here in, this, in, in verse 14. He talks about, okay, if, if you're going to go and obey the law, what you actually do is you, you, in doing so, you nullify this promise of God. You make it void. And it's like, whoa, 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 hold on, God. You're telling me that, that this beautiful gift of grace, this offer, this promise that is on offer, the moment that I introduce the law into as my way to be right with God, it actually nullifies this free gift. And the answer is yes. L listen, listen to Galatians 3, 17 and 18. Listen to what he says. He says, this is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise, which is impossible. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God's graciously, he gave it to Abraham as a promise. That's what he's trying to say. Essentially, what he is saying is that if the inheritance was a promise from God by faith, then 430 years later, there is this list of rules that shows up, and you have to keep them in order to inheritance. He's saying, no, no, no. If that's the case, it makes God's promise worthless and faith is useless, and you better get to work. Literally, the word is, in doing so, in, in keeping to the adherence of the law for your salvation, it has literally emptied and invalidated and destroyed and rendered ineffective is the language in the Greek of what it's trying to describe here. I think sometimes what we try to do is we try to take the grace of God, the free gift of salvation through faith, and we try to mix it with the law of God, and we try to like put it in a blender and make this beautiful smoothie of, of law and grace. Don't mix them. They're not meant to be mixed. By adding one to the other doesn't make it stronger. It also doesn't make it weaker. It says here that it actually destroys it. Those are strong words. It's important to understand this. This is what John Stott says. He says, um, 
Something can be given to us either by law or by promise. Since God is the author of both, but they cannot be in operation simultaneously. As Paul has written in Galatians, if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. Law and promise belong to two different categories of thought, which are incompatible. Law language says you shall, and it demands our obedience and our behavior and our upkeeping, our adherence. But promise language says I will from God and it demands our faith. What God said to Abraham was not obey this law and I will bless you, but I will bless you, do you believe me? Law, transgression, wrath, they all hang out at the same pub. For the law turns sin into transgression. That's that deliberate trespass against God. And transgression brings about the wrath of God. It provokes the wrath of God. Remember the function of the law. The law came in to make us aware of my sin and my need for Jesus, not to try to make me right with Jesus. Do you guys remember the story of King Josiah? No? Okay. Here's the story of King Josiah. This is a cool story. So King Josiah, he's eight years old when he becomes king, okay? And it says about him that he didn't turn to the left or the right, that he was straight, in, straight as an arrow. He followed the ways of David. He did what his father did, right? He followed in the footsteps. He was doing everything right. And one day, it was time to give their offerings. You can find this in uh, 2 Kings but one day it was time to give their, uh, their offerings, as they did, and um, his secretary comes up to him, Shaphan. And Shaphan goes, hey, I'll take this offering to the high priest. And so he goes, cool, go. And Shaphan and the high priest are in the temple, and they stumble upon this book. They stumble upon this book, and they start reading it. And they realize it's the law of God, that it's the commands of God, that it's, that it's truly the words of God that are to be upheld by his people. And uh, so they do the offering thing, and then his secretary comes back to um, King Josiah. Josiah's like 26 at this age, and he says, hey, we found this book. Can I read it to you? And King Josiah goes, yeah, let's do it. And so they crack this book open, and he starts to read it, and King Josiah literally starts ripping the clothes off of his body in terror, frightened by what he's reading. This is a man who has lived up to everything he thought he was supposed to be living up to, doing all the right things, following the way of his father, staying on the straight and narrow. And yet he read the commands of God, the laws of God, and he knew, guilty. Guilty, I'm a sinner. I'm a, oh my gosh. And he cried out to the high priest and to his secretary, and he goes, will you go and intercede for me and for all the people? We need salvation. We need hope. We need something because the wrath of God is mighty and the wrath of God will fall on us. That's what the law does. The law is meant to convict of your sin. It has never been meant to save you. Does that make sense? It's a cool story. Not that cool of a story, but it's an amazing picture of what the law does. The law was never meant to make one right before God. It could never justify or sanctify anyone. In fact, trying to keep the law leads to more sinning. Did you know that? Because the very nature of the law is to produce more need for Jesus. Listen to this statement by our same author. We'll get to it in a couple of weeks. Romans 7, 7 says, Yet if I had not been for the law, I would not have known my sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, listen to this, but sin seizing an opportunity through the law, sin seizing an opportunity through the law produced in me all kinds of covetedness. It like, not only does it make you aware of your sin and your need for Jesus, but it also produces this thing in you that causes you to want to sin more. Right? I learned this from my dad. Um, it's John Lynch. Give it up for John Lynch. It's like this. Try to not think of a blue snow cone. 
all you can think of is the blue. Like, that's what the law does, right? The very definition, actually, let's, let's read where, where he goes from here, though. That is why it depends on faith. Everyone say it together. Let's read that first sentence together. That is why it depends on faith. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace. Where does the promise rest on? Grace. The very definition of grace is a free gift. And if it's a free gift, then no law, no work, no ceremony, no lineage, no religion, no people group, nothing... Only faith can be the means for our salvation. Anything apart from receiving makes it no longer grace. It makes it obligation or payment. But in fact, it is grace. It has rested on grace. That it might be guaranteed to all his offsprings, not only the ones who have adhered to the law, but also to the ones who share the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He's saying not only, it's not available to just those who were keeping the law, the the Jewish people or, or the people of God, but now it's available to all who would follow in the footsteps of Abraham, who would trust God through faith. He said that's what makes it so significant. Romans 11, 6 says this, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. And then it says this incredible statement, Otherwise... Grace would no longer be grace. Just as law, works, and transgressions hang out at the same pub, so then do grace, promise, faith, and blessing. This is the word picture that he is trying to have us receive. But then he makes this final thought. He says, all are included. Did you know you're included? That you're no longer outsiders. That you're no longer aliens, it says in another passage, but that you are part of the family of God. That's what he's trying to say here. He's saying, if Abraham trusted through faith, anyone who comes along and trusts it through faith and believes in Jesus Christ, receives salvation, receives righteousness, and now is a part of the family. Law brings division. Because because it's only set apart for this select group of people, right? Right? And the only people who receive the blessing then are that select group of people. But, but what grace preaches, what faith preaches, is unity. Is all are welcome at the table. All are welcome at the foot of the cross. All are welcome for the bloodshed of Jesus Christ, for the saving of our souls. I better get an amen. amen. Um, some will use this statement to describe this thing called replacement theology, that the church replaces Israel. Uh, This is not replacement theology. This is called grafting theology. This is where we all get included at the table. Um, And so just know that that passage gets abused and that's not what it's there for. He's going to... um, These were big theological doctrine statements. He's now going to begin to evaluate the faith of Abraham. He's going to give us kind of a a little bit of a window into how Abraham saw God and what it produced and how it moved in his life. Um, So let's see what he says. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. That's actually his name. Um, In the presence of the God who in whom he believed. This is what Abraham believed. He believed this about God. He is the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope. Underline that. We'll get to that in a second. Come on. That he should become the father of many nations as he has been told, so shall your offspring be. As great as one's faith may be, if that faith If that faith is placed in the wrong object, it is bad faith. The strength of one's faith does not save them. The object of one's faith is what saves them. Right? Who was the object of Abraham's faith? It was the God who gives life to death and the one who can make something out of nothing. That's a good God. That's a big God. That's a real big God. Like literally the one 
who could create you out of nothing. Literally the God who could create all things out of nothing. Einstein didn't believe that at first, and then they did this like telescope thing where he could see red things. In the, I don't know what he saw, but he realized that there was a beginning, that things all of a sudden started appearing. That's because there's a God who at one moment in history, there was nothing, and he said, let there be things. That's amazing. It's also a God that can actually make dead bones dance, right? That can make things that are once dead to come alive. Do you know that you've been made alive through Christ Jesus? You were once dead in your trespasses, but now in Christ Jesus, you have been made alive. We often measure our faith on how much faith we possess or how strong of a faith you have. How it should be measured is by how big of a thing that you have put your faith in is. As we will see next, what grows our faith is not working towards more faith, but seeing a God who is bigger than the things that should derail our faith. The key to this faith is the object of your faith, not the amount or the outcome of your faith. What can happen really quick is you can turn your faith back into works. Don't try to collect more faith points. Don't try to put your faith on the faith and doubt scale and hope that your faith outweighs the doubt. I hear people say all the time, I got to get more faith. I just need more faith. I just need more faith. If I could just get a little bit more faith, what you might actually need is a bigger God. He's not changing. He's already big. You might need to start believing in a bigger God. Until you believe that he is the sustainer of all things, the giver of all things, the protector of all things, the perfecter of all things, until you know that he cares, that he loves you, that he seeks your best, until you know that he has life on offer, like real, full life on offer, and that he breathes life into dry bones, and he can make the crippled walk and the blind see, until you believe that no moment goes by that he has not already seen, orchestrated, or allowed, you will chase after the accumulation of faith instead of the security of the object of your faith. The goal is not to acquire more faith. The goal is to learn more about the power and faithfulness of the one that you have put your faith in. And call upon his name, and let him be the author and the mature of your faith. Do you know that scripture says that he's the author and the perfecter of your faith, not you? Is that amazing? Do you remember the story in Mark 9? This, uh, this dad, he's got this, this boy that is like possessed, right? And it says that these, these demon, this demon that's in him keeps like trying to destroy the boy, throws him into the water, throws him into the fire. He like convulses and, and this, it's happening right here in this moment. And Jesus walks up and he's like, what's going on? And the dad goes, help. He goes, this is my boy. And I don't know what's going on, but, it, but this, this thing is destroying, it's trying to kill him. And he goes, if you can do anything, and Jesus stops him and he goes, if I can do anything? And he goes, listen, um, if you can believe, then I can do anything. And the guy goes, I believe, but help my unbelief. Right? Right? Jesus was far less concerned with the amount of belief, right? The amount of faith, how big of a mountain of faith this man had. The man was like, I, I, I believe, but man, you gotta, you're going to have to show up because I got a lot of unbelief. And Jesus goes, well, then let's try this on for size. And he goes to the boy and he yells at this demon. He says, get the heck out of here and never return. And the demon goes and the boy is healed. You see, he's the one that authors and perfects our faith. He is the one who, 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 who will take the littlest bit of faith and say, you're good, I got you. As long as that faith is in me, it's enough. I think sometimes we get it wrong. We think that we've got to have this big old faith. Jesus just says, just give me a little bit. Just trust in me. If you just trust upon my name, I'll do the rest. I'll work the rest out. Jesus seems to be so less concerned about the completeness or the eloquence or the amount of faith someone has. 
It's always just the question is, is it me that you're trusting in? And then he says, all right, you good then. The next thing we'll learn here in a second is that when you're, the object of your faith is placed correctly, um, actually the obstacles to your faith diminish and the outpouring and the outcomes of your faith are incredible. Transforming. This is what we're going to get to see through Abraham. This faith is not just a salvation faith. Did you know that? This is a faith, a now faith, like a living faith, one that, one that lives and breathes and moves in and through you. This is a now thing, too. You're going to see Abraham not just talk about this ticket to heaven, but a life lived through faith. This is not just a faith that one day you will get to the pearly gates. It's a faith in God who brings life to the dead things. That his very life has made you new and alive. That once you were dead and now you are alive, it is a faith that says, darkness, you are no longer my master. I do not have to obey your demands. I am no longer your slave. It is a faith that moves you into that space. It is a faith that now speaks of freedom. It is a faith that speaks of hope, a faith that believes that it can bring hope where there is no hope. He can make come things that do not exist. It is a faith that looks past the pain and it looks to his promise. Look what it says right here. Verse 18. This is a crazy statement. In hope he believed against hope. What does that mean? It means this. When there was no hope, he still had hope. When God said, I'm going to make a mighty nation through you and that there's going to be this land and there's going to be these people and I'm going to be your God and this is going to be sustained through my power. And he goes, you know about my girl, right? And you know about me. There is no hope for that to actually be true. But he believed in the one where hope resides. And so even when there was no hope, he trusted in hope. This is one of the greatest gifts of this life in Christ is that he has given us through grace the means by which to be right with him by faith and it also is the same thing that he gives so that we might experience this life in and through him. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says this, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so now walk in him. The same way you received him. How did you receive him? Through faith. Now walk in that same way. Walk in that same way. It says this, therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus, so now walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in what? Faith. All right, let's keep going. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief, Listen to this. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew stronger in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced, underline, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. He was 100 years old. His wife's body, her womb, was dead. He got double dead. And he was convinced that, they, that he believed in a God who could make dead things alive. Did you know that it's okay to reason and to consider? Do you see it twice there? It says consider. Do you know that it's okay to reason and consider when applying faith? Do you know that it doesn't have to just be this blind lemming thing where you just like walk off the edge of a cliff to trust God? Do you know that you can actually think about it and it's okay? That God's not mad at you if you think about your faith? That you consider, look, he considered his wife and the barrenness of her, his womb. He considered his age, and he considered it right up against what God had promised to him. He's like, we got this over here, and God telling me this over here. Mm. That's called considering. That's called thinking through your faith. Faith without reason is this thing called fideism or fideism. And reason without faith is called rationalism. Neither of them are fully biblical. 
Fideism says that you can't know anything about God, nothing logically or concrete about God, so you have to believe by faith and only faith. Rationalism says the only way to know is if all the facts line up. But scripture says that God has made himself known. And yet the foundation of our faith as a person we've not seen and a home we've not arrived at and a personhood that we've not fully been transformed into. So it's okay to reason and to consider and to think when it comes to faith. But here's the catch. Here's the catch. When you consider the obstacles of your faith, the barrenness of his wife and his age, if they are bigger than the object of your faith, your faith will be weakened. If the object of your faith is larger than the obstacles, you will grow in faith and you will worship even when the obstacle is still there. So understand what he's saying. Understand what's being taught, right? Is that if you've got a big God, right? Even when there's big obstacles, right? Like let's say this is, this is the obstacle and that's God, right? If you've got a big God and a big obstacle, right? You can still see God in the background and you still know everything's going to be okay, right? And you get strengthened by it. You find yourself worshiping in the midst of this. But if you make your obstacle too big, right? And you put it too much in your face and you say, this thing is everything. I can't even see that big God, even though it's very big, right? And so when you consider the obstacle of your faith bigger than the object of your faith, your faith will actually be weakened. But if the object of your faith is larger than the obstacle, you will grow in faith. And you will find that in that growth, you end up worshiping, even if the obstacle is still there. Abraham believed the impossible of God breaking his promises. Right? He said, God said this to me, and if he's God, then it would actually be impossible for him to not be true to what he says. So he actually believed in the impossible of God breaking his promises, and he believed that that was far greater than the impossible of his girl given birth. Right? He took the two impossibles and he put them by each other, and he goes, yeah, God's not going not gonna to lie. And he chose to believe in that reality. All right, let's keep going. Does that make sense? This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Underlined counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, was not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. Underlined, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespass and raised for our justification. Do you know that um, when God is the object of your faith, when he is the thing that, that, that your faith resides in, um, the obstacles actually begin to shrink. And your faith actually begins to grow because, um, because faith in God actually produces something. Something comes out of it. When the object of your faith is God, what you'll find is that the outcomes of your faith will be magnificent, will be amazing. Let, let's talk about some of the outcomes. Uh, you actually gain the righteousness of Christ. Putting your trust in Christ, Christ you actually gain his righteousness. That's a big deal. You'll be able to worship in the middle of the storm. That's what we just learned. And you will become stronger. You'll grow. You'll mature. You'll be strengthened. Those are the three that we get from this. We're going to get a bunch more. I told you five through eight. You better be here. But let's be careful here. We can quickly have faith in the outcome of our faith. Right? Right? Our hope then begins to reside in those outcomes. Faith is not believing in the outcomes or the blessings of God. Faith is believing in Him and trusting the outcomes He provides. You see what it says here? 
It says, but for ours only, it will be counted to us who believe in him who is raised from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, in him. In him. It will be counted to us who believe in him. You see, the goal is faith in him. I hear this all the time. Brother, we are believing that God will do this or that for you, and we are believing that it's going to be great, and we are believing that God's going to do this wonderful thing in you, and we believe the bondage is going to go and the breakthrough and, the, and it's beautiful, and amen. But our faith is not put in the outcomes, my friends. Our faith is put in the one who controls all the outcomes, who holds all things. The goal is that we would find our faith in him, not in what he's going to do. The goal is that our trust and our hope would be in him, not in all the things that he provides. And guess what? When you have trust in him, no matter what comes, the real secret sauce is a life that says, God, I trust you and I will walk into whatever you put before me and I will leave the outcomes up to you. We can quickly make a theology and a doctrine about breakthrough and healing and movements and provisions. And I admit that even my prayers sound a lot like someone that is trusting in the some things instead of trusting in the someone. And the beautiful gift of God's grace is that he says, just trust in me and I'll take care of the rest. Will you just trust in me? Will you trust that I'm good? Will you trust that I'm faithful? Will you trust I'm not going anywhere? Will you trust that I love you? Will you, will you trust that I'm big enough to deal with you? Will you trust that I'm big enough to deal with that situation? Will you believe in me? Will your faith be the thing that sustains you? Don't wait for this thing. Don't wait for this thing. Don't wait for this thing. Trust in me, and I will be there, and I will be all that you need. But don't miss this last little thing. We would be uh, silly to skip this last little bit. Faith in him produces a life covered in him. Do you know what he's describing here is this most incredible thing that is found in Scripture? One of the most incredible things is that through faith when we believe, we actually get imputed to us the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Don't, don't miss this reality that what he spent weeks and weeks of us hearing is that all of us are sinners, all of us are broken, all of us are evil and wicked in the eyes of God because of his, who he is. And that all of a sudden, if we choose to say, Jesus, I believe in you, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the, the Lamb that is slain. I believe that your blood covers my sins. I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe in you that he says all of a sudden, not only are we justified, we talked about justified, right? The slate gets cleaned. But he goes, now, hold on, you are the righteousness of Christ Jesus now. Literally, the robe of righteousness, the full attributes of the righteousness of God is wrapped around you. And this is just half of the deal. We're going to get to learn about it in a couple weeks. We are actually, this is the imputed righteousness, right? Right? This is when God looks at us, he sees the fullness of Christ Jesus. But guess what? It gets better. In a couple of weeks, we're going to learn that we also get the imparted righteousness of Christ Jesus, that we've actually been transformed and made new, that it is no longer I that lives, but it is Christ that lives in and through me. This is amazing. This is what faith brings about is the righteousness of Christ Jesus for crazy sinners like us who are no longer sinners because we are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Is that good news? He just throws it in there about Abraham. He's like, the guy trusted in me, and it was credited to him as righteousness, but it's not just for him. I want to tell you, it's for you also. Anyone who would trust in his name becomes the righteousness of Christ Jesus. It's the good news, my friends. It says this, that he, delivered, he was delivered for our sin and raised for our justification. His death dealt with our death, and his life dealt with our newness of life, our cleansing and our washing. If you believe that he's big enough to take your death and give you his life, that's what Abraham believed in. He believed in a God who could bring death and bring it into life. Then just like Abraham, you are now declared the righteousness of God. This is something to celebrate. This is a faith that saves. This is a faith that transforms. And this is a faith that matures. And this is a faith that sustains you. 
And that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stop there. Um, that's why it's, that's like why it's such a big deal when, when we take this communion. We do, we do it every Sunday, but it's like, I think sometimes we just go, yeah, 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 the blood of Jesus and the cross and everything. No, do you understand the reality of what took place when he made us new and clean and he washed us, right? Like, it's amazing. So as you take it, as we take communion today, we're going to worship together. Let's worship our faces off. We only got a few more minutes, but let's do it. Um, but take this communion realizing that the imputed right of Christ is, Christ is now yours through, through his bloodshed, through his cross, through his finished work. Can I pray for us? Lord Jesus, we take this communion and we do it under the umbrella of your finished work in the remembrance of what you've done and how you've changed us and how you've made us new and the faith that you now give us in your name. We love you and we uh, thank you for the work that you did. We thank you for a way that comes to you that just says trust, and we trust you, Lord Jesus. We give you our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, feel free to get up and take communion. We've also got our prayer warriors. You're going to have Margarita over here, and you're going to have Doug over there in the corner. If you're needing prayer, um, they would love to get to pray for you, but this is our time to worship and take communion together. Love you guys. Sorry I went a little long. Just as people are moving around, I just feel that I want to say this too. You guys, the gospel of Jesus Christ has gone out this morning. And uh, there is no greater day to come than the one that is here right now if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today is the day. Uh, I believe that, that there, there may be ears here this morning that, that this grace of God, this good news of Jesus is, has hit you, has penetrated your heart. You've heard it. Your heart has started to sing. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit is saying, come. I know you by name. And uh, I urge you that if that is you, if you're in here this morning, if you have not uh, said, Jesus, yes, I choose now this day to put my faith in you, would you do it today? And because all that we have shared that is on offer, it is, it is the truth. And uh, there's many who would pray with you. Find Margarita, find Doug, f find Caleb, find any, any one of us. And we would pray with you. We would usher you into this family of God. And so I, I just urge you to do that if, that if the Holy Spirit is leading you to do that this morning. Bye. 
Jesus, you are so worthy to be praised. And we place our faith in your beautiful, wonderful, powerful name. And we give you all the praise in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today is Open Home Community. So uh, if you're plugged in to one of those, make sure you show up at your host home at 4.30 this afternoon. If you are not in one of those groups, you can sign up on our events page. Hey, I'm seeing a lot of young people here too. Um, if you are in college or post-college up to 30, if you would call yourself a young adult, please come and find me. We've got stuff. We're doing stuff. Um, college groups hanging out at my place this Tuesday. Please come and find me. I'd love to meet you. Have an amazing Sunday. Hey, real quick. Um... We're starting another service in six minutes, so you guys got to get out of here. We love you, but we don't love you that much. So get the heck, no, just go. We love you.